Welcome to the Healthcare IT Today CIO podcast. I'm John Lynn, the founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. I'm excited to bring you the most practical healthcare CIO insights and perspectives. We know your job is challenging and we want to help you be more successful. And our guest today is Aaron Martin. He's a, a DexCare board member and he's also executive vice president and chief digital officer at Providence. Welcome, Aaron. Hey, thank you so much, John. Uh, great to be here. Yeah, so yeah, you have, I think, some unique perspectives, uh, you know, and very entrepreneurial for a healthcare organization. But before we dive into that, tell us a little bit about yourself and Providence. Yeah, I've been at Providence uh, eight years. Uh, we're a large health system based in Seattle with about 120,000 caregivers, um, 26 billion in revenue, mainly covering the West Coast. So our biggest markets are Seattle, Oregon, and Southern California. Great. Well, you know, I, I think what was interesting uh, for me is is kind of learning about some of the work you're doing around digital health and di digital innovation there at Providence. What is really your overarching approach to those two areas, digital health and digital innovation? Yeah, I, it's basically driven by the needs of a $26 billion health system, you know, first and foremost. So we you know, kind of our processes, we work with our clinical and operations colleagues to kind of identify what we call opportunity areas. Uh, we break them down into, you know, specific potential kind of solutions. And then we run them through a process. The first step is, you know, do we already have uh, a digital solution for the problem that or that may help with the problem or the opportunity in our toolbox or in our existing uh, technology portfolio? If we don't, then we give it to uh, Providence Ventures. Uh, it's a venture fund that we operate with 26, uh, 27 portfolio companies. Uh, they go out and they look for what we call best of breed solutions in the market. If we don't have it and we can't find it in the market, then we'll build it actually. And so we have a venture studio that actually creates new companies. We've done that three times uh, so wow. far. Um, you know, the first one being a company called Zelf. Second uh -huh. one being a company called Wildflower. And then the latest is a company called DexCare that we, we spun out last March. Awesome. So let's talk about DexCare, right? I think it's it's fascinating that you incubated that company in your digital innovation group and they just raised $50 million. So I guess, mm -hmm. is that going to high school or college? I'm not quite sure, you know, <laughs> your child's grown up and, and out in the real world, right? But right. tell us about the platform, uh, you know, along with, you know, where did it start and where's it really headed? Yeah, where it started was, you know, a few years back, we were looking for a solution to power what we call our on-demand healthcare business. And so that includes retail healthcare, um, our virtual visits, so kind of, you know, telehealth, as well as our urgent care business. And we really kind of looked in the market, couldn't find a solution uh, that was adequate for what we were trying to kind of accomplish. And so uh, built DexCare from kind of the ground up. Um, was this pre-COVID or was this, I yeah. mean, how does the timeline wise? Yes, it, it was pre-COVID. And it's one of those things that you bring up with COVID. There are several different technologies had we been, you know, had COVID come a couple of years earlier or we had uh -huh. been a couple of years late. We'd been in a much different uh, situation to kind of respond to COVID. I mean, right. like interesting thing, we were one of we were the first health system in the country to see a COVID positive uh, uh, case in the United States. It was up in our Everett um, uh, ministry, and uh, yeah. it's been you know kind of uh, all hands on deck ever since. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you were perfectly positioned because then DexCare you could use to respond to COVID. Uh, so where's it headed now? I mean, obviously, I'm sure it's matured over the two years uh, dealing with COVID. Yeah. So it's really kind of expanding into, you know, much more of a, of a platform around doing several different things. First is it's incredibly good at what we call demand aggregation. So we what it does is it 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 finds, you know, patients who are looking for care. Uh, sometime in the next, you know, kind of, you know, five minutes to, you know, 48 hours all across the internet in our, in our, in our kind of, you know, footprint, uh, it navigates those patients to the right venue of care uh, based on what, you know, their chief complaint might be. And then it also, and this was incredibly helpful during COVID, it also does load balancing. So mm. in the same way, you know, that you might, you know, have, you know, for instance, uh, any kind of scheduling platform, 
that's that uses kind of uh, AI to kind of find you the correct slot and the you know for the right uh, uh, um, you know venue of care. Um, this platform does that, and and the reason why that matters so much is it lowers the amount of wait time that a patient might have. Um, it makes sure that when they go to that venue of care, they don't waste their time. Uh, so for instance, we're not sending people to telehealth who can't be seen through telehealth, for instance, um, those types of things. And so really, it's really kind of grown into to a large platform from that point of view. Hmm. And is that why you decided to develop it yourself in-house? Because there's there's a lot of symptom checkers and telehealth and all, you know, I mean, we, we literally there's hundreds of those, you know, virtual health, digital front door solutions at healthcare IT today. But is that one of the aspects of DexCare that was key and why you developed yourself? Is that load balancing or were there some other aspects as well? Yeah, it was, it was a whole bunch of different things in that it, none of those platforms really kind of work together in a seamless fashion to again, kind of make sure that a patient could find us on the internet effectively through SEO, SEM, and local uh, you know, technologies, uh, navigate to the right venue of care, and then make sure that once they get to that venue of care, we're sending them to the place where they're going to have the best experience. Um, they were all kind of like, you know, back then kind of point solutions where you had, you know, telehealth vendors, you had some scheduling software, you really didn't have anything doing load balancing at all. And you had some kind of, you know, bespoke SEO, SEM, yeah. local types of technologies that um, that you could potentially dial in for this purpose, but you constantly had to be on top of it. And this these three things kind of work together seamlessly. So let me give you a for instance. Mm -hmm. um, one example of how the platform works is if you're uh, if we know if we can predict that a, a, a certain location, a physical location is about to fill up uh, with patients, we're not going to direct patients through uh, search engine marketing to that location. We'll send them to the next closest available location. So they're not just being kind of dropped off into kind of a landing page to kind of go into, you know, scheduling in a clinic that is already full, for instance. Seems like a super obvious thing, but it's not automated in these other platforms. In this case, it is. Gotcha. I mean, you sound more like a chief marketing officer or a VP of marketing, the way you're talking, which is is interesting. I mean, are you able to do that? I mean, you're, you're obviously chief digital officer, which is kind of a new title that's kind of bridging those two worlds. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how are you really able to be this entrepreneurial in such a large organization? Well, I mean, a couple of things. One thing to note is, is chief digital officers outside of healthcare. Typically, the marketing team, and in this case, the marketing team does report to me. Okay. Um, so our chief marketing officer does report into to, to, to my position. Um, you know, outside of healthcare, that is very typical uh, hmm. combination. They typically are, are, are folks with backgrounds similar to mine in e-commerce or um, the internet. Uh, and they do have a, a pretty deep uh, marketing and a technology background. And the reason that those two things go together is, is one part is demand generation. And then the digital platform actually index care being an important part of that converts that demand into, you know, actual patients and customers. And so it's hard to kind of keep those two pieces separate. So that's mm -hmm. the operational part of my job. The, um, the innovation part of it is, is really kind of, you know, trying to to fill gaps in the market where we don't see solutions, right? And if you fill gaps, if it's an important problem, mm -hmm. right? It's a problem that, you know, we stack rank, we put a value on these problems, like what's it worth to us if we solve these problems or we get the, you know, or we, we um, clear these opportunities, for instance. Um, if it's a big enough problem for us, it implies a large uh, total addressable market in terms of, you know, a business. Right. So that means it's probably worth, you know, at least building a product against if we can't find something out there. And again, if we have exhausted all other options and we build as a last resort, you've got some kind of greenfield space in which to kind of run and run a solution. So we found that, you know, that combination of a, you know, big market market opportunity, um, you know, greenfield space where we can kind of build in that that doesn't have a lot of competition yet or can be differentiated. Uh, and then pairing that with a great management team like we, we mm -hmm. got with DexCare and the right investors, those four kind of elements really kind of help us be successful with these, these companies. And the last thing I'll say about it is 
the point of spinning these companies out is not the financial result that we get from you know, our equity in these companies. It's the ability to sustain the platforms, right? So if you think about it this way, I've got a, for a health system, a large team of like a hundred software engineers that, that build these, these new technologies. Uh -huh. It's not a thousand and it's not 10,000. It never will be because we couldn't afford that. We're not a technology company. So the question is, is how do we sustain and leverage our resources so that mm -hmm. we can work on one problem after another and not have to con continue to sustain it? So the example I always use is, um, you know, when, when we started a company called Zelf, uh, you know, the, our first spin out from about four or five years ago, uh -huh. um, internally, we had four people working on the problem that they're working on. Now they have over 60, wow. you know, um, and they've got 20 health systems using their platform and they raised over $50 million in venture capital. So they're getting the resources, they're getting, you know, more advice from more health systems so the product gets better. And most importantly to us, it, the product is sustained and, and the roadmap is executed and we can move on to the next problem we want to go after. Yeah. So speaking of those problems, what's a hard problem you're still working on, you're trying to solve? Yeah, one that we just finished uh, solving uh, was, believe it's it's pretty in the weeds, but it's pretty important. I think it okay. might resonate with your your uh, your listeners. It's the integration of single sign-on into EMRs. Mm. So the problem we're trying to solve is we have millions of patients that today log into MyChart. So we're a big Epic customer. Okay. Um, the problem is, is, is that we wanted to own the identity layer. So we want to own the layer in which people kind of, you know, provide their credentials and log in on. And so we had, you know, kind of one option, which is, you know, have people create new credentials. So I like my job. I don't want to get fired. So <laughs> pass on that. I don't want uh -huh. 3 million people to be asked to kind of create new credentials. That'd be a horrible customer experience. Uh -huh. So instead, what we did is we built an integration with Epic between uh, Microsoft's um, SSO product, B2C, and, uh, and Epic that allows users to use their existing Epic credentials to log into our identity layer. Uh -huh. And there's a whole lot of engineering that went around that to make that possible, make it seamless and make it secure. But that's a good example of, you know, a pretty robust platform that allows us now to eliminate the friction of people having to have multiple different logins based on, you know, what are they using our app? Are they using my chart? Are they using a different app that we're sponsoring, et cetera. Now they can use the exact same credential everywhere. If they've already got a credential through my chart, which is the vast majority of our, our users, they don't have to change their credentials. And then we um, can now see the patient's login and we can start building and putting other technologies underneath that uh, identity layer. And we can also have a better kind of 360 understanding of our, of our patients versus all the information going into our, our, our EMR and being kind of a black box. Wow. It's a classic example of uh, a lot of hard work makes something really simple. You know, and yeah, the simplest I, the, takes the, joke, the most work. <laughs> yeah, the joke I... Well, I guess it wasn't a joke, but the thing I told my boss, Rod Hockman, who's the CEO, is the best case scenario is you never hear about this project, right? It just <laughs> happens, right? So, you know, worst case scenario is you hear about, you hear about it a lot um, because people are having a hard time logging in or whatnot, but the team did an exceptional job of building the platform and didn't have an issue. So, so the next step for us is to kind of license that out and so that other health systems can use that same technology because we've talked to other um health systems who have the exact same problem they're trying to solve. No, it makes sense. Awesome. Well, we like to always cover a little bit of career stuff as well. Uh, what do you think has been the key to success for your career? Uh, you know, I think uh, the, 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 there, there's a couple of things I would say. One is um, I actually was in healthcare a long time ago, then went pivoted and went into technology, mm -hmm. um, started a couple of companies one in banking and financial services software, a second one in manufacturing software, and then um, joined Amazon. And I think that the, the combination of the two startup experiences that I had and then Amazon, which is like, you know, the world's biggest <laughs> startup, yep. um, you know, really kind of prepared me to kind of um, think differently about problems, um, you know, be able to, at what we call at Amazon, you know, start with the, the customer and work your way back. So always, always kind of think about what the customer's problem is. And I think the challenge in, in healthcare is we're, we're also 
supply constrained as well. So the equal kind of tenant in this entire thing is, is the caregiver is what we call our employee. Um, you know, the clinician, the, the nurse, the, the physician. So how do you make both sides of that equation work um, seamlessly, right? And it's not good enough just to have, you know, a lot of times at Amazon, we would launch, uh, you know, kind of a consumer facing platform that was brilliant, worked perfectly, but, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on in the background that was, you know, kind of hard to scale and, to, and we would kind of do that next, right? You know, we, we'd kind of start tightening the bolts on the carriage as the rocket ship was going off, right? Um, you can't really do that in healthcare. It's gotta basically work for both the patient and the provider. And so, you know, there've been times where we really have nailed the patient experience and sometimes it's been kind of clunky on the provider experience. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, one of the things I've learned about healthcare is you've got to keep both sides of the equation really, really happy uh, from that point of view. Yeah, that's a great lesson. Is there anything else you'd share? I mean, I feel like we need more people like you that have had experience at startups and in industries other than healthcare coming in. Uh, any advice you'd give to someone who, you know, it seems like it always comes from the uh, people who've made it in tech and now they want to solve a, a meaningful problem in healthcare. <laughs> and yeah. they come in. Uh, yeah. What would you, what advice would you give them? Well, I mean, the first thing I would say is the good news is there's a lot of people like me coming into healthcare now, right? Um, I, I started eight years ago and it was such a rarity uh -huh. uh, for somebody from a big tech company to be in healthcare that in the industry, I was known as that guy from Amazon. <laughs> like, you know, they didn't know my name. They just knew me as that. Yeah. That's uh -huh. that guy from Amazon. Um, fortunately now that's not the case. You know, there's a, there's a ton of folks kind of coming into the industry, um, moving into chief digital officer roles and that kind of thing. And I think the key thing I tell folks is, um, you, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna go through three stages, right? Okay. Um, stage one is hubris and you got to get through that as quickly as possible uh -huh. um, because you're going to look at these problems that seem like they have obvious solutions because of your background in media or tech or whatever that should be easy to solve. And you're just going to be like, okay, I'm here to help. Right. What you got to do is you got to be very intellectually curious and really ask a ton of questions because 99.9999% of the time, there's a very involved problem that is hard to deal with you buried in there, right? It's either a regulation, it's either, um, you know, something technical, there's some way that the platforms work that you don't anticipate, et cetera, right? So you just got to get through that as quick as possible. It's unavoidable, but you got to get through it. Um, you know, the next step, you know, is what I call the pit of despair, where <laughs> <laughs> you realize that, man, all these problems are really, really hard. And some of them feel intractable and you feel like you're pushing up against like, you know, a granite wall and it's just not going to move. And, you know, then there's like, you know, the next step, which is you kind of make a decision. You're either in, for, in, it, in it for the long run or you bail and you're like, OK, this, there's easier ways to make money in media or tech or whatever. You know, I'm going to go do that. The folks that really kind of stick with it really the, the reason why they're doing it is for the mission, yeah, right? Yeah. So like the, the, the meta point I'm making is be humble, be curious. It is a very complicated industry. It's not one industry saying you're from healthcare. Isn't like saying you're from Europe, you know, <laughs> like there's a lot of different differentiality within Europe. Right. Yep. Um, and, you know, and, and just, you know, um, and then, and then be in it with, for the right reasons, you have to be in it for the mission um, nothing else because there are easier ways to make money, but there aren't better ways to make money is the way I would, I would, I would put it. Wow. I've, I've never seen someone describe it so well. I, I love your three stages because it describes what I've seen over and over again. Oh, I can a, even tell you, like if I met somebody from technology coming in, I can tell you what stage they're in and, <laughs> you know, and I'm it's like, true. you're in a bit of you're despair. Right. You kind of look like you're having a, you're yeah. having a day. So, you have a you pivot know. point. You're going to have to decide soon. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Uh, any piece of advice you've received that uh, could be helpful to other CIOs out there or, or leaders in healthcare? Yeah. I, you know, I, I think that the key thing is, is, um, you know, um, remember what it was like during COVID. We all got a lot of stuff done really, really quickly and for the most part safely. Right. So don't let, let's let, not as an industry tell ourselves it's impossible to move quickly and be agile. 
right? You can't do it all the time. There's got to be planning. We can't all be in kind of a, you know, uh, you know, you know, kind of a, uh, a rush to get everything deployed because, you know, not, we're not in a, in a complete state of emergency, but I will kind of, you know, say that what that taught me is what organizations need in our industry are, are, are focus on the things that really matter, right? The things, the two or three things you're going to get done this year and then focus on those things, right? And it might surprise people, you know, it might, you know, my, my, my background at Amazon, Amazon is a very focused place. You know, they have a above and below the line kind of methodology where here are the, the four or five things we're going to get done for this business this year. And they're, here are the things that we're going to do next year or the year after or backlog and just try to get the organization focused. And then the last thing I would say is try to have a, a product mindset, not a to-do list mindset. So, mm -hmm. you know, don't be an order taker, create a product that your business partners can react to. And what I mean by that is, what is the value proposition? What's the problem you're trying to solve and how are you gonna solve it? And then let them react to it. And then be curious about what their problem is. Not, don't, don't just have a kind of list of, you know, functionality you're going to go deploy in, you know, some specific order, right? It's got to be kind of a, a suite of things that you're going to go do to help your, 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 your internal customer. Aaron, this has been awesome. I've, I've learned so much from you. You uh, come at it from such a different perspective. And I think our CIO audience is going to really enjoy this. So thanks so much for being here with us. And thanks everyone for watching and listening. If you want to find the rest of the episodes in the CIO podcast, you can check them out at healthcareittoday.com. And of course, on your favorite podcasting platform. So be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks so much, Aaron. Thank you.